Hello, everyone. Uh, we are going to be exploring what could possibly be uh, the workflow for the Linux kernel development. We're just going to open. We're just going to open one little door a little bit to see maybe this is some of the, one of the workflows that could be adopted adopted by some people. But first, um, who? from you are kernel developers. Okay, we got some. Any maintainers here? Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, okay. Okay, that's good. Welcome. <clears throat> we'll be focusing mostly on GitLab here. Uh, as, as it was in the abstract, so please don't go away. Uh, who of you have used GitLab before? Yeah, quite a number. Okay, good. Then it's gonna be easier. So I'm Nikolai Kondrashov. I work at Red Hat uh, in the CKI project, but also at uh, Linux Foundation's kernel CI project where I help with uh, CI things and I do electronics and embedded as a hobby and I'm living in Finland. Yeah, and I'm Thales. I'm working from Brazil, joined Red Hat last year and I'm part of the continuous kernel integration here for the Red Hat kernel. So, <clears throat> I don't know how many of you heard this, but this actually happened. This actually happened in 2023 at Maintainer Summit. When uh, there was a discussion about maintainer load and how they don't have time for anything and how they are overloaded, uh, there was a discussion about <clears throat> the need for reviewer help and Linus jumped in and, say, and said that, well, reviewing is boring, no wonder that nobody wants to do it. And that he said, and that he sees huge patch sets landing on the mail list, but nothing really happening to them much. They're getting resent, and they're not moving forward. And he said that what is really needed is to find a way to get away from a email workflow, from email patch model. <clears throat> he didn't say what it should be. Uh, he left it to developers and maintainers to figure out. We don't know what it's going to be either but we are just gonna present you one possible thing. But first, the email workflow, well, a lot of you know what it is, but basically you take your patches, you send it to mail list, you do it just right, and maybe you will pass the review, after which uh, it gets merged into the maintainer tree, maintainers execute some tests, and, and then eventually it gets pulled by Linux <coughs> into the main line. Of course, it's not, as easy as I said, uh, there, there could be a lot of things which will stop your contribution, like basic things like formatting problems or you know, coding style in general. There's conflicts with the, uh, with, the, with the tree or something doesn't compile somewhere, things like that. And of course, like the review itself, but the review is what you have to do, right? It's, it's these all small things which eat away at maintainer and reviewer time and if you have multiple sp <clears throat> spins to this review, it, it's more and more every time. Well, it's actually less and less every time, but the more review spins you have, the more time is lost <clears throat> on these things. And then the maintainers, they have to run the testing and it's not always perfect and they have to do some <laughs> custom stuff and it's like, needs some manual work as well, sometimes. So, there's, there's a lot of tools that people made to make this uh, easier and bearable, and one of the most popular ones is, is Patchwork, which just basically <clears throat> looks at the mailing list, extracts all the discussions and patches, and organizes them in a database, and identifies the patch sets and patches, and then it looks at the tags and responses and tracks, it, like if this patch set was approved, or it was reviewed, or it was tested, and, and it puts it into the into the overview of those, like here. <clears throat> then it also accepts um, testing information from, our, from an external system. It doesn't do testing itself, but it can accept that information, then put it into the database, and then provide you with the summary, which looks uh, something like this. You can see at the bottom there are some tests, and uh, what they do, and what's the status. That helps. So, so yeah, what's the best next, next thing? Uh, there's a lot of opinions, <clears throat> and as I said, 
we just presenting one, but there's a lot of discussion and everybody, you know, have their own opinion, which is fine. Uh, and then there are people who say that people are just lazy or stupid and they, they just, just have to, you know, get stronger and look at all the details every time and, you know, do it perfectly, otherwise they're stupid. I'm not going to comment on that. So, we like, we like Git Forges, that's why, that's why we're talking about this. And uh, there's a number of them, some open source, some not so open source, some completely not open source. But we use GitLab a lot, so we're going to talk about it because we know it better. Okay, so there's already some <coughs> kernel subtrees and projects or kernel-related projects which use GitLab. Some of them just have a mirror there, like, hmm, just a free mirror, that's fine. Uh, some of them also track issues there. And GitLab has pretty good issue tracking, if a little simple, but I think it's for developers, it's better <coughs> if it's simple. Um, yeah, some of them track a lot of issues, you can see here. And others even use CI there, uh, a little bit or a little more. And finally, the most advanced use is using the actual MR workflow, the contribution workflow with all the bells and whistles, <clears throat> and some of them use it a lot. Okay, but we'll now focus on CI. Yeah, so there's too much details to cover, so I'll be running around. The Intel XE driver for the Intel XE GPU, they pretty much developed their, their driver on the mailing list. They you normally use the Intel GFX CI, which is an intricate uh, CI system running uh, IGT and other tests on their labs. Then they post their results to Patchwork, and Patchwork posts the results on the mailing list back. They also have a GitLab repo, which they happen to have some CI there, which is implemented itself in another repo. And it's quite simple, like they run some check patches, they build the docs, and they build the kernel, of course. This is the whole CI uh, YAML. It's quite short, it's under 100 lines. But then comes the media folks, who are responsible for the media subsystem, and also some user space libraries. They also develop an email list, they also track their work on patchwork, and in their case, they're using Jenkins to run some tests. And they also have a presence on the GitLab. In fact, this year, they are working on a very sophisticated CI, which you can all go uh, read the documentations. It's very well documented already. And they have a few more steps to it. For example, they have the, uh, some ABI checks to see if you're not breaking the ABI. They run some more static checks other than the check patch. They build the kernel in more architectures, in more compilers, in more configs, and there's more. They also run some bisection checks, of course, not running the whole pipeline again on each commit, but just trying to see if each commit builds, and some simple checks. They finally run the actual test on virtual machines, and they run some checks on each commit to see if they have the proper trailers, the sign off by and the review by. And finally, they have a, a fi fancy report, uh, HTML report, that you can see the whole summary of the pipeline. Um, unfortunately, they are not using the MR workflow, as I said, but so, so their CIO only runs on pushes. But they're planning, from what I heard in the last meeting, they're planning to send, submit the results back to Patchwork and have that fancy HTML report uh, somehow linked in there. So now is a 3D. Well, it's not really kernel. They are the uh, user space libraries for rendering things on the RM. You might have heard of Daniel Vetter. He's been there pushing for change in, in the development since, well, way further back than 2018. But in 2018, he made a point about migrating to GitLab and showing why he himself chose GitLab. So you can see his, his talk there is very interesting as well. And in fact, after only six years, they're already working fully on GitLab. They, well, they're working fully on GitLab. They have over 10,000 MRs already merged. 
And here's one example of the, one of the merge requests that's been there for quite a while. In fact, for half of the history they have been on GitLab. Um, itself has a lot of discussions going back and forth between developers, but not only that. Some of these interactions that happened in the Atermar during these three years were actually from a bot, which they used to not only um, work around some limit, limitations of GitLab to keep the uh, branch synced with the target branch, we're basing it before running the CI, but also because of the CI limitations, uh, because they have a limited farm resources there. So whenever the bot feels like the MR is ready to be merged, past the CI, everything is green, it, 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 the bot itself merges the MR, and, and that's it. In fact, I'm saying I'm talking about their CI. In these three years, they ran the CI 81 times, and the CI, in fact, is quite a picture. Well, as you can not see here, there's basically five steps. You have some checks to see if the pipeline can run at all. Then you have to prepare the builders for the test suites. Then you build the test suites. Then you run the test suites on the devices. Then they have a, quite a large farm of devices there. Um, and finally, you publish the results. There's a lot of other tale about the CI if, you want, if you're interested in it, from a presentation from David Hubbard and Eric Nunes. Uh, so you can watch that as well. They were here last year. And I don't know if they are here right now. But then, talking about the kernel itself, the, the, the kernel part of the DRM, you have the DRM project, which is responsible for uh, well, basically handling things on the kernel side. And you might have heard of it because it has a history of trying to do things differently in the kernel. Like it has a whole tree architecture of uh, maintainers, like multiple maintainers, multiple committers. And this year, there's been more changes there. In, just in January, uh, we had the 6.7 bring the DRM CI already there. So it's something upstream about CI on GitLab that Helen is the current maintainer. In fact, she has also some talks you can watch in more detail. And from their talk, from her talk, well, we can see that it derives from Mesa CI. So if Mesa CI has the big pipeline, does that mean that DRM CI was born? Well, let's compare them. We prepare the builders, we build the test suites, we run the test on the device. They're basically the same picture, give or take. So how you can join the fund there? Well, as I said, it's upstream, so you can check the documentation upstream. It's a very nice documentation. It's basically three simple steps. You, have, you need a tree on free desktop, so that can mean forking a tree there with the DRM uh, tree. Then you enable the CI file, which in this case means point it to the upstream GitLab YAML. And finally, you request to be added to the DRM CI OK group, which is how they handle, uh, how they avoid misusing the CI, because it, it runs in the farm. So that sounds easy, but there's a catch. You, first, the community needs to trust you. So that might take up some time. You might need some patches there. So eventually, you might need the same process that you would need to become a committer there which Ellen raised uh, as a point in her presentation as well. It's focused on maintainers so far. So, and not only that, the, the DRM CI has lower priority against the, the MESDA CI. So how can we work around that? How can we have something like DRM CI for everyone on the main line? <clears throat> yeah, so the problem is that DRM CI and MESA 3D CI, they use the same labs and they share the hardware. So DRM CI gets the, gets the lower priority and you need to go like through approval process to get access to the hardware. And then it's mostly focused on making sure maintainers get access to this. So that's why, um, that's why Helen started work uh, in mainline, in upstream, submitting the GitLab CI for the Linux kernel. 
Um, so this, this was developed with the help of the kernel CI community a little bit. Well, she did most of the work, actually. Uh, the idea was to just give the developers an easy way to run CI on GitLab and to have like a generic solution that we can start with something simple and with some customization. So she wrote like a good documentation how to use this from the start and when this was posted, we got a lot of feedback, although a noticeable part of it was about our use of Slack. In, in the end, Linus, uh, we did a little conversation with him and uh, he said, He's not objecting so as long as it's merged as, as a sort of a, like templates for the CI, not DCI, but something that you can start using quickly, you can copy, you can you know, use it as a boilerplate. Uh, Helen didn't have time to finish this yet. Uh, she does a lot of stuff, but it's, it's gonna come. So it's quite simple, basic. Uh, it runs, <clears throat> Runs the build, then the check patch, then smash, and then builds the docs. Oh, no, sorry, it builds the container first, of course. Then it builds the docs and builds the kernel and then does some housekeeping. Uh, the point is that this you can get just from a stock GitLab CI. You don't need to do anything, you don't need the hardware. This completes kind of quickly and that lets you create a feedback loop, which is the thing that, that is too slow in the kernel in general. I have a separate talk about that. So, um, and this, this is kind of simple, and you can, you can use the GitLab, the free GitLab, but it has a limited compute time that you can use, and the kernel build will eat through that, through that quickly, but you can use your own self-hosted runners and build it on your machine, integrate it with the, with the CI workflow. So, and finally, um, a little bit different thing is how we actually had do kernel development in GitLab. It's fully on GitLab. Uh, we, we keep all the trees separately. <laughs> and here are the um, CentOS stream kernel repos. We also have the rel repos, which are private, of course. And we maintain some tools to help the developers who don't want to use Web UI much. They can use the command line, <clears throat> which helps with adoption, of course. Uh, so, yes, uh, we do merge requests and everything. And those merge requests have to fit in the, in the workflow at Red Hat, like all the steps and all the, all the procedures that we have to keep. And that is done with the help of uh, bots and labels or tags, if you like. Here you can see that it went through all kinds of checks and passed all of them, and there's classification and everything, but also there are bot comments. For example, uh, a bot says that this, this, um, this MR is all right with the, with the Bugzilla status, which doesn't have just the Bugzilla bug, and it's, all, it's, it's linked with the JIRA status, that it's the ticket is in the right state, and uh, it's all right, it can go in. Then it checks that there's a sign-off is correct, and the and the um, so this is the pipeline status. <coughs> These pipelines ran. The test testing was fine. This was failed, but it was optional. And then there is uh, assignment for for reviewers, like it determines which subsystems are touched, and uh, then the particular reviewers for these subsystems are called in for the review, for the optional review, or for the mandatory review. There is just too many of those bot comments. Um, you can check the link out if you want to read this. But the point is that no humans had to do these checks. No humans had to look at the formatting of your commit message, if you included everything there, if you did the, 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 the uh, bugs uh, properly, if you submitted all, all the info, all the processes taken care of, well, most of it at least, and nobody had to spend time on it. You just look at those labels, it says, okay, you can merge. And this is the normal um, you know, testing summary that you could see on a merge request, which hides this behind it. Uh, 
which is uh, actually uh, five pipelines in one. And it's just for one case, like it's just one pipeline failure. We, we have different collections of pipelines for different, uh, different trees, different combinations, and blah, blah, blah. We are very flexible there, but don't ask us to show you our YAML. So this is, the, this is the, the, the main part of the pipeline, which basically all it does is prepares for tests. So this is, this is the meaty stuff. Uh, and when it finishes, we load the data into our database and we have the web UI to show this. And these are not tests, the counts are not the tests, but most of them are actually test suites. So there's much more actual tests there. Uh, yes, so why are we talking about this and why do we think it's interesting? Uh, we think that GitLab is quite good. So it's, it's Git, like, like well, everything else these days, of course. But that's, that's a requirement for the kernel, right? Uh, it has a quite good code review web UI. It's not perfect. Like, you cannot do reviews of commit messages and stuff. But I think it's possible to live with that. Uh, there is a great a big automation API. So these bots were made through that automation API. You can explore what to merge request, the states, and you know, all the labels, and you can interact with that, and you can access the data about the state of merge request. Patchwork provides that as well, but the problem is it's, it's trying to get that information from a mail list. And of course, it has the best of breed CI these days. It's, it's considered like the best, one of the best. So you can do it in, for gating, for pre-merge testing, post-merge testing. The commits reference your test results. Like you can go to any old commit and see like what test results you had there. Uh, you can have self-managed runners on your hardware doing whatever you want. Like Mesa 3 dci does testing in Lava, in, uh, in uh, Valve's labs, etc. All commandeered by GitLab. And of course, you can have your own self-managed instance if you don't like GitLab, like pre-desktop do, like uh, Linara does, Red Hat does have uh, an internal instance. Like you can have your own and do whatever you want with it. And then it's open core, uh, MIT license, and the company behind it is open source friendly. So what's, what's so bad about it? That's the common arguments against GitLab. So centralization is one of the big ones and the traditional one for the kernel community. It's a single point of failure, right? It's a single server, you can say. But, well, it makes things easier by being single point, right? It has all the information. It's a trade-off. It's not great in that sense in reliability, but it gives you a lot of things. Yes. Uh, it is controlled by a corporation, like by the um, company that does GitLab, yes. Not fully open, only open core. Some features are left out from the free version, and they are only available to paying customers for premium access. Uh, Red Hat uses some of those, but you don't have to use them. Uh, and you have to sign in into each instance, but external authentication helps with that. And finally, the one thing that some people don't like is that it's not anonymous. You can send an email to the, um, to the mailing list with your patches using any email, right? And that's possible. Well, people will probably look very carefully at your patches, but it's possible. It's not so possible with GitLab. You have to authenticate somehow. But again, you only need an email for that. Then <clears throat> some people say that VBI is slow and hard to navigate. Yes, it is, it is slower than a text, text interface like a command line. And then the final thing is that you need to be online to review code. In theory, in the, with, the email, uh, with the email workflow, you can review your patches, prepare your emails and responses, save it, and then when you go online, they got sent out. That's also true. So... Yes, email overflow is flexible and democratic. Anybody can participate. You can do anything. You can respond anyhow. Do whatever you want there. But 
that's the, the, the flip side is that it's fussy. You have to go and observe all the rules, how to participate, so that automated tools can actually process it, right? You have to do it by hand. And uh, yeah, people will make their choice and they will choose whatever workflow and they, will, and they will stay with email workflow. A lot of people probably will. Some people will move on like, like DRM did, right? And some people will use something else. But the point is, GitLab comes at a cost. Learning, limitations, all these things. But it saves you time and effort through automation and integration. You don't have to do things manually. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Questions, complaints, arguments? Yes? Okay, thank you. The question was, uh, how does using GitLab compare to using Garrett in, in pair, for example, with Jenkins? First of all, friends, don't let friends use Jenkins. Uh, then, yeah, it could work. It's fine. And, and yes, Garrett does a good job, a very good job with reviews, absolutely. It was good even 10 years ago, right? GitLab is not there. It will work. You can use your own pipeline and everything. But GitLab does, as I said, very good CI. It has, well, the MAR workflow is kind of similar to having Garrett with a CI system, but it's not as well integrated. It works. As I said, you, if you prefer that, use it. Jen, uh, Garrett doesn't have issues integrated with your commit, so you cannot close an issue through a commit right, in, in, in Garrett, in Garrett. Uh, there is, um, I don't know, lots of project management tools and, you know, all kinds of whist bells and whistles there. So if that's your thing, I think GitLab is, is better in that sense. Yes? Versus what experience? Uh, uh, in a way, it's more of a trade-off of uh, integration versus precision, let's say so. Like it's, uh, GitLab tries to do the whole development thing, the whole workflow. In that sense, like it needs more things, the, the, the focus is more spread, things are not so well developed like, like, in, like in Garrett. I don't think they are trying they are, you know, I think that the developer experience is important for them, but they're not targeting hardcore developers as such. There is an issue open that asks for reviews in commit messages for a few years now. And I think some people managed to nudge them towards that and saying like, hey, if you do that, maybe the kernel will come here. So there is some, there is some back and forth going on and some things that like, you know, kind of ridiculous sometimes. But the thing is that it's possible to talk to them. And in theory, you can submit your own patch and try to convince them. You can, of course, fork it, but I would not recommend it, unless you're a corporation or something. And if I may interject, if you want uh, to hear about the Gary, someone that tried using Garrett, you can talk to Prerit, because he, he actually tried with Don Zikus, and well, they, they decided to use GitLab in the end, so. If there, she asked if there is a trade-off between the developer experience and the CI experience.
Yeah. <clears throat> once we stopped supporting, yeah, once we stopped supporting uh, pulling patches from patchwork, we freed up time to do more CI stuff. We supported patchwork in CKI at Red Hat at first, but then we just, we just said, okay, yeah. So it freed us time to focus on, you know, actually doing testing and hurting all this stuff because it is, it is complicated, especially with our park of machines, our trees and everything. Yes? There's kernel CI. <laughs> There's kernel CI, yeah. yeah. Actually, uh, there is, the question was, if there is any collaboration between all these people that we mentioned uh, regarding testing in the Linux kernel. Like, do they, do they share the test or any standards or anything? <sighs> there is, okay? And people try to, to get together and discuss things and, you know, find something similar like theirs. There is a... Uh, two test suites in the, in the upstream kernel. There's K-unit for unit tests and K-self tests, and people are encouraged to contribute there. There is LTP, which is outside the Linux kernel, and people are encouraged to contribute there, and people do. And there is a whole bunch of test suites for different purposes floating around, and each area kind of like tries to use the same test suite and you know, do those things which are most suitable for that subsystem. There is also kernel CI, which tries, uh, where, where, where I work as well, which tries to bring these things together, but it's a community. It's not like we cannot dictate the same as, as an incorporation, right? We are trying to build good system and good interfaces so that people would come and join. The example is KCIDB, which is a database for storing test results and putting them in a dashboard and sending notifications that I work on, and that is uh, slowly picking up momentum. There is a bunch of CI systems which submit their results there. So there is certainly cooperation, but the area is so large and the needs are so different that it's difficult to, you know, to bring them all together. So we're starting from the end, from the reporting side, this case IDB, for example. But there is also efforts to standardize test suite output. There's K, the K tab format, like a kind of like a tab format test anything protocol, but for the kernel, which is being developed for the, for the kernel test. And it's used somewhere, but again, like, it's another standard. Yeah, and what I said there, like the media CI and the DRM CI, they're mostly sharing the same things for MIS as, as, as well. And everyone who works on that system, is, sometimes they join these kernel CI meetings, or the OATS meeting, the open, I don't know, the rest of it. And there is yeah. a, there is a uh, weekly, uh, a monthly conference for people who are interested in uh, testing the kernel, yeah. Open, uh, open automated testing standards called OATS, yes. You can find it if you try. Yes, the question. Yeah. Source hub. Source hub. Source hub. Yeah, I, I, uh, the question is, uh, so GitLab, has, so, so the person here is saying that they're using GitLab, but it's kind of slow. So they were developing the, uh, their own project, which is kind of trying to replace at least some of what GitLab does, and it's much faster. It's called source hub. We heard about it. I never used it. Alice? I never used it. Yeah. We, we haven't used it yet. I heard good things about it as well. And it, yeah, exactly. So it really comes from the first question there that was, uh, well, whether there's trade-offs, which to choose, and there's really, you will have to wait someone to use it. So we are proposing using GitLab. We are will provide templates to use it. If someone comes and do something in Garrett, people should use it. If someone comes and do things for Source Hut, People should use it. We're really just, you know, trying to tell people that they should try to do something. With this, yeah. But yeah. modernize the workflow, as Parrot said. 
Yes, we're out of time, unfortunately. You can catch us here or on social media. Our contacts are in slides or, I don't know, send us a message or whatever. Thank you.